Can you hear me in the back? Can we hear? You get, you, excellent. Fantastic. Listen, before we get started, uh, these things are always a problem. So you might as well go ahead and, and just cut these off right now so that we don't have to have to worry about that. Um, Fire Marshal is going to be mad enough as it is. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Don Gordon, the Executive Director of the Riley Institute, and it is absolutely a pleasure to me to see all of you, all 600 and something of you tonight. Uh, we're especially happy to be joined tonight by two of our heroes, uh, former two-time governor of South Carolina and U.S. Secretary of Education, and Betty Farr. Thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. For the seventh year in a row, we're once again partnering with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Furman. And I, quite frankly, I can't say enough about, and those of you who are members of the OLLI program already know this, what a great organization OLLI at Furman really is. And under the direction of Nancy Kennedy, wonderful partners to have, uh, a fantastic organization. We love working with them. I'm particularly happy to have this opportunity to welcome you on the first night of the Straight Talk Summer Series in which we look at the rise of fake news, at why we are so easily duped, why these, how these false stories impact politics and real news, and what we can do to fight back against the constant barrage of misinformation. Now, as you know, I think, in addition to fostering diversity leadership throughout the state and working actively to support high quality public education in the state and beyond, a big piece of Furman's Riley Institute's work is to broaden student and community perspectives about issues critical to South Carolina's future and to its progress, and to do so in a nonpartisan, rhetoric-free, fact-based way. And we have kept those ideals in mind as we worked with Ollie very carefully to build this important and incredibly timely program over the next three weeks. I'm excited about it. I think you're going to enjoy this time. I think you'll feel it to be extremely well spent, and we really appreciate you for being here. Now with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Danielle Vinson, our series moderator. Danielle is a stellar member of our Department of Politics and International Relations. She has a particular interest in Congress and in the media. She's perfectly positioned to help us examine these issues. Please welcome Danielle Vinson. Good evening, welcome. Um, we've got some interesting speakers this evening and we want you to be part of the program as well. So, we're gonna give you an opportunity to ask questions. There's a number at the bottom of the screen where you can text your questions. Please do include your name. If you prefer to handwrite your questions, I hope you picked up a card on the way in and if you'll hang on to those cards, we'll have students coming to collect them a, a little bit later in the program. Um, so, before we get started with our speakers, we have noticed that we've all heard a lot about fake news over the last year. Uh, but as we discuss it this evening, we thought we, it might be useful to spend a few minutes defining fake news. First, what it is not. It is not information or reporting that the president or other politicians simply disagree with or find inconvenient. So, CNN as an organization is not fake news. As with any other cable news organization, and in fact many organizations out there that claim to be news, uh, there may be pundits, guests, or even hosts of their shows from time to time who traffic in fake news. But they also have journalists and editors at these organizations who are trying to report what's actually going on in the world and to provide analysis to help us make sense of it. They may get information wrong from time to time, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about fake news. I think the distinctions may be easier to see if we can understand misinformation and disinformation. I'm gonna draw on the work of Claire Wardle, the research director at First Draft News, whose typology of misinformation and disinformation you see on the screen. Misinformation 
is the inadvertent sharing of false information. So for example, unintentional factual, excuse me, unintentional factual reporting errors, um, failure to provide accurate context for information that is otherwise accurate. Politicians do this frequently, we call it spin. While these may cause confusion, and they certainly do irritate politicians, they're not typically what we think of when we think about fake news. In contrast, disinformation is the deliberate creation and sharing of information known to be false. There are a range of reasons people might engage in disinformation. Some do it to entertain and perhaps to make us think a little bit. Think about satire and parody when you think of those. Some intend to profit from it. Some of the fake news sites that cropped up in 2016 were started by 20-something-year-olds who simply wanted to make a buck and weren't all that interested in politics. Some is intended to produce a particular outcome or advocate for a cause. Uh, some of the propaganda that we saw in the 26 campaign was intended to influence how people voted, often by raising concerns about one candidate or the other. You right, remember the false story that was completely made up about Hillary Clinton's involvement in an alleged sex trafficking operation run out of the D.C. pizza place. The only thing true about the story was the D.C. pizza place and they were not happy with it. <laughs> Please note that not all propaganda is false or intended to deceive. For example, the Federalist Papers advocated the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. They were certainly propaganda, but I don't think we'd really consider Hamilton and Madison as purveyors of fake news. So, during this series, when we refer to fake news, we'll be primarily concerned about disinformation that is known to be false, not merely misleading, and that's intended or likely to deceive. Now one challenge we face as we try to inform ourselves is how to distinguish what is fake news. Let's take a few examples and see how you do. I'm gonna, we're gonna show you a couple of things that have been alleged, and I want you to help me decide whether they're true or false. I'll ask for a show of hands. This first one, Donald Trump told People Magazine in 1998 that if he ever ran for president, he'd do it as a Republican because, quote, they're the dumbest group of voters in the country, and that he could lie and they'd still eat it up. So, show of hands, how many think that actually happened? All right, hands down. How many think that is false, that that did not happen? Okay, some of you are still not sure, right? All right, this is in fact false. Snopes' search of people's comprehensive online content archive turned up no interviewer profile of Donald Trump in 1998 or any other time that quoted him saying anything even vaguely resembling the words you just saw. All right, let's try another one. Liberty University, Ted Cruz said there was no place for gays or atheists in America. How many of you believe that Ted Cruz did indeed say that at, a li at Liberty University? True? Okay, hands down. False? Okay, it's still a lot of undecideds out there. <laughs> Y'all are contemplating, that's good. All right, this is in fact also false. While it's true that Cruz spoke at Liberty University on that date, there's no evidence he uttered this phrase, and the Washington Post's official transcript of Cruz's speech does not include this comment nor any other remark by Cruz about either atheists or gays. All right, let's try another. Shortly after Donald Trump declined to condemn David Duke and the KKK during an interview on CNN's State of the Union in February of 2016, a photograph circulated online purportedly showing Hillary Clinton kissing a former KKK leader. True? Hands up. Okay. False? Oh, my. This is true sort of. <laughs> this is where context matters. Uh, she did indeed kiss Robert Byrd on the cheek there. Uh, and Senator Byrd, in his life before national politics, had in the 1940s helped organize a chapter of the KKK in West Virginia. He was chosen as the group's leader. He later told CNN that his involvement with the Klan was the greatest mistake of his life. So, context here might matter. All right, let's try one more. 
Reports have claimed that Marion Robinson, Barack Obama's mother-in-law, will receive a $160,000 government pension for services rendered as full-time in-home caregiver to her granddaughters, Malia and Sasha Obama, during their time in the White House. How many of you think that that is in fact true, that she will be receiving that pension? Oh, okay. How many faults? All right, that one is false. Uh, while it is true she lived in the White House and she did often care for her granddaughters, she was not a government employee. She will not receive a pension. Now, how many of you got all of those right? Hands. <laughs> Congratulations to the four people I see with their hands in the air. For the rest of you, don't feel bad. Our first speaker is going to help us understand why we might be susceptible to fake news. Jason Tans is the site director for Wired, which is covered and led in the digital revolution. Having worked at Wired for a decade, Jason leads digital strategy, and he's also served as executive editor and editor at large. He's written dozens of stories for Wired, Wired including features about machine learning, the economics of Netflix, and the future of the news. A graduate of Brown University, his work has also appeared in the New York Times, Fortune, Esquire, and other publications. And he's the author of The Other People's Property, A Shadow History of Hip Hop in White America. Before Jason comes to talk, we'd like to show you a brief video of Jason explaining our vulnerability to confirmation bias. Have a, have a sneaky suspicion that liberals are prone to violence? You're more likely to pay attention to raucous leftist demonstrations at Berkeley while downplaying acts of violence at Donald Trump's own campaign rallies. They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. And liberals tend to do the opposite. That's confirmation bias, the tendency we all have to interpret information in a way that supports what we already believe. And it's what we're talking about in this episode of Argument Clinic, a guide to spotting bad arguments on the internet. We are all inherently biased. We tend to weigh evidence more heavily if it confirms our belief and discount evidence that doesn't. And the internet, especially social media, is a giant confirmation bias machine. It makes it easy to find evidence to support just about any argument you want to make and ignore all the other stuff. For instance, let's say you want to prove that Trump supporters are violent. So you Google violent Trump supporters. You'll find a long list of ugly incidents. Of course, there may be millions of peaceful Trump supporters out there, but you didn't Google that. Social media, like Facebook, presents the same problem. We tend to like information that we agree with, which means we see more of it, which means we think there's more of it, which means we must be right, right? That's why we have stuff like the scientific method, which uses control groups and placebos and peer review to ensure that our pre-existing ideas don't infect our findings. It's also why lawyers try to screen out biased jury members whose experiences and beliefs might prevent them from weighing evidence and arguments objectively. Now, unfortunately, most of the information online doesn't meet those standards. Just the opposite, in fact. Most of it is engineered to create an emotional response, not a rational one, because emotions are what get us to click and share. And there's no better way to stir people's emotions than by convincing them that they are right about everything and that anyone who disagrees is a moron. We'll never be able to eradicate confirmation bias, but we can at least try to limit it in our own lives. So just remember, anecdotes are not data. Be open to arguments that challenge your beliefs, and be modest and skeptical of everything you read, even if, no, especially if, it seems to prove what you already thought in the first place. Thank you. Does my voice really sound like that? <laughs> it's, it's very uncomfortable watching that video in front of all of you. Um, so I'm a practicing journalist, um, and that means that if this room is representative of the rest of the country, about 32% of you will believe anything that I have to say tonight. Uh, and to those 32%, I say, uh, meet me afterwards, because I have some really exciting timeshare opportunities that you are going to want to take advantage of. Um, but listen, people have always hated the press. That is not a new thing. Um, if you go back to 2004, the numbers were a little bit higher. 44% of people trusted the press. But 2003 was the last time it topped 51%. My point is, this is not Facebook's fault. And we're obviously in a very perilous moment for the press and for democracy. Uh, and in those moments, it can be hard to remember what has changed recently and what are longer term developments. 
the, the threat of fake news is something that has been decades in the making. Uh, and it behooves us to go back and remember what pre-exists the internet, what pre-exists social media. So another thing that pre-exists social media uh, is the argument that uh, the news media is sensationalistic and debases itself in its quest for readers or viewers. Um, Patty Chayefsky called this one back in 1979 in the movie Network, which you may remember from Howard Beale screaming, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. But what that movie was really about was about the combination of the news and entertainment divisions and how it turned uh, a, a once uh, venerable newscast into a phantasmagoria of crowd-pleasing rage and vapid infotainment, which might sound familiar. Um, it's also not new that the news media is in dire financial trouble. Uh, the advertising model is in free fall and has been for at least 20 years since Craigslist started gobbling up all those classified ads. So we've seen wave after wave in that time of layoffs and belt tightenings and closures. Um, again, that all happened before Facebook. Um, but here's what has changed since the rise of social media. It's in some ways a deeper and more troubling phenomenon. Uh, we have gone from a culture and an industry that manufactures consent you see where I'm going with this, to a culture and an industry that manufactures dissent. So here's what I mean by that. Um, the expression manufacturing consent uh, comes from Walter Lippmann, who wrote a book called Public Opinion, um, but it was really revived in 1988, excuse me, by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. It's the title of a book uh, that they wrote, and in it they argued that the news media was too powerful that it limited discourse and it closed audiences off from large chunks of the world. And that's because it was run by a small handful of companies that could afford to build the infrastructure to reach a mass national audience. That was a barrier to entry. They kept smaller, scrappier voices out of the national conversation. Uh, they were funded by large national advertisers who wouldn't want their advertising to appear next to anything too controversial. And those factors meant that outlying opinions or stuff that was deemed too fringe were cut out of the conversation, as they wrote, leaving only the cleansed residue fit to print. Uh, it kind of gives another spin on the old saw about all the news that's fit to print, who determines what all that news is. So basically they were arguing that the very structure of the industry favored broad, bland, middle of the road news. So the good news is, that's not true anymore. Um, and it is good news, actually. Um, journalists no longer have a stranglehold on the world's information. They no longer have the power to decide what events or ideas merit inclusion in the national conversation. But the bad news is that the press may have been replaced by something even more poisonous. And as I said, that's the system that uh, has its own biases toward disagreement, emotion, and outrage. So we've gone from a system, again, that manufactures consent to one that manufactures dissent. So let's take a deeper look at what this means. Let's go back to an earlier era where there were sort of three main broadcast networks, and they were all competing to get the largest audience. So if that's, where, if that's the industry that you live in, you basically just need to beat the other two. Um, and that means reaching as broad an audience as you can. Uh, so you want to be as kind of uncontroversial, uh, you want to have as wide a funnel as you can, right? But today, audiences can choose from infinite sources that are available to them at any time. Everybody's not sitting down at five o'clock to choose from the three broadcasts that are available at that moment. At any time of any day, they can choose any news source they want. And uh, that means that changes the economics substantially. Now they're looking for the source that speaks most directly to their interests, beliefs, and emotions. And that's why, for instance, in the, in the, in the broadcast television era, you're perfectly happy if you can make 50 million people's fifth favorite show, because if that's the only show that's on in the time when they're watching, they'll probably watch it. But companies like Netflix would rather make one million people's number one top favorite show, because why would anybody watch their fifth favorite show when there are four shows they like more available to them at any time? So a fragmented marketplace favors passion and it favors depth. Now that's great for Netflix or Amazon, because they have subscription businesses. But most journalism is still funded by advertising. And as ad rates have fallen deeper and deeper, they need to reach a larger and larger audience. So it's sort of a paradox. They need to speak with the passion of a niche publication, but reach an audience of millions. So how do you reach an audience that large? You have to get them to spread the word for you. 
you have to get them to share it on social media because Facebook is the new front page. So it used to be that editors decided what got published and what showed up on the front page every day, but now readers are not an audience anymore. They are actually publishers themselves. They are determining what shows up on that front page. That gives them a ton of power. If they don't share it, it may as well never have been published in the first place. So how do you get somebody to share something? This is where I repeat the video a little bit. By triggering their emotions, and usually not the good ones. If you want to get someone to share something, make them angry. A recent paper in Human Communication Research found that anger was, oop, you can still hear me here? All right. Found that anger was the uh, key mediating mechanism determining whether someone shared information on Facebook. And the stories they shared tended to make the people who read them even more furious. So, so let's do a show of hands. How many times have people here shared a story uh, with the note, oh my God, can you believe this jerk? Why isn't he or she in jail? <laughs> I have. Have you? Yeah? How many times have you shared a story and written, well, this was a little dry, but it's really important context to understanding the conflict in Afghanistan? <laughs> I rest my case. You know what else people like sharing? I told you so. News that proves they were right all along. News that confirms their beliefs. It turns out that as biased as the media might be, the human mind is more biased. We pay much more attention to information that supports what we already think, and we discount the stuff that contradicts it. And that's just human nature. In fact, I'll actually go off note here for a second and say that um, usually when the news media is accused of being biased, it's because they were insufficient in, contra in counteracting the bias of individual human brains, right? That's what they're supposed to do. That's what their job is. That's what they try to do. They don't always succeed. But that's not to say that individual humans are inherently less biased, quite the opposite. Um, that's just human nature. And you can see how in a world where readers are essentially deciding what gets published every day, that kind of subjectivity can feed on itself. So if I think Trump is terrible, I am much more likely to share news that confirms he's terrible, rather than news showing that he's done something great, and vice versa. Now, maybe this wouldn't be so awful if, if everybody could see what everybody else was sharing, because different people have different biases. You know, you'd see some stuff you agree with, some stuff you disagree with, but at least you'd be exposed to all the arguments. But the internet is a people-pleasing machine, and it wants to show you the stuff you want to see. So if you press like and you comment on a bunch of news stories that you happen to agree with, or if you follow those links more often, or even spend more time reading them, you'll get fed more of those kinds of stories. Even if you have some friends on Facebook who disagree with you, you might never see their posts. And this is that filter bubble that you've heard so much about. So as I say, this is not just a problem about the news industry, it's a problem of human nature. We are fallible, manipulable creatures. Left solely to our own gut instincts, we will make terrible decisions. This seems obvious to anyone who is the parent of an eight-year-old, as I am. But it wasn't so obvious to many of the people who built our modern digital media infrastructure, in part because most of them weren't much older than eight themselves when they did so. <laughs> They thought that getting rid of middlemen and authority would liberate people to find more meaningful sources of information and better understand their world. They thought there was inherent wisdom in the crowd and that the decentralized power of millions of people would bend toward truth. And so if you gave them the ability to create their own media and if you gave them the power to determine what gets published and how far it spreads, the result would naturally be a more ennobling and informative system than one controlled by a few gatekeepers. Now let's be clear, those gatekeepers were no saints. It's not like the news media never played to people's emotions or biases, but at least they tried to present a complete picture of the world, and importantly, it was a complete package. They gave you the gossip column in the op-ed, but also the sober analysis of the siege in Aleppo. So maybe you flipped through it, right? Maybe you didn't pay attention to it, but you at least saw the headline. Not only that, you funded that reporting, even if you only read the, even if you only did the crossword. But on the internet, those stories are completely disaggregated. They exist as independent items, and they all compete on the same footing. And that's great news for dessert, but bad news for vegetables. And it's really hard to build a business based on giving people something they don't actually want. Now, I'm of the opinion that journalists have failed their audiences by not doing a better job of adjusting their coverage to reach readers and viewers where they live, and not trying to harder to make important news meaningful to them. Whoa, five minutes, all right. Um, we can talk about that later if we want, but it left a huge vacuum for people who didn't feel like the news media was talking to them or cared about them. 
And this is what opened the door for fake news. This media environment is actually tailor-made for it. So you can do this for money, right? There's an 18-year-old Macedonian teen. Let's call him Boris. Boris wrote a ton of salacious, this is a true story. He wrote a ton of salacious and completely made up news articles about the presidential election, pro-Trump in this case. Uh, they may not have been accurate, but they created an emotional response from a certain audience. It tapped into their confirmation bias. It made them feel good, and so they shared it. Now, this guy wasn't a reputable publisher, but again, Facebook cared more that he was popular than that he was reputable, and that was true of Facebook's audience as well. So its algorithm made it more likely to show up in like-minded people's feeds. And once that genie is out of the bottle, it's hard to put back. You could write a very convincing story debunking Boris's articles, but how many people are gonna share it? Saying, oops, I shouldn't have shared that article before. Not too many. Anyway, Boris over a few months made $16,000, which is about 16 times the average salary in his native Macedonia. But wait. You're saying, I thought advertisers didn't want to appear next to controversial stories. So why are they suddenly willing to pay to appear next to fake news from Macedonia? Well, that's because the advertising business has changed as well. Advertisers used to pick an outlet whose audience had some overlap with the audience they were trying to reach and paid to reach them through the media outlet. Now, thanks to something called programmatic advertising, they actually follow those individuals around the internet wherever they go and pay for advertising to appear next to them, which is why they end up doing things like funding you know, terroristic videos on Google. Um, now, money is actually a relatively benign motive, and not every purveyor of fake news is so innocent. Um, fa Facebook and Twitter are obviously breeding grounds for disinformation. Propagandists of all sorts have learned that just as you can shut down public discourse by choking it off, you can also shut it down by flooding it with garbage. People get overwhelmed, they don't know what to believe, and they stop trying to form an objective understanding of the world. The end result is the same. So here we are. It's a world without manufactured consensus, which is good, but it's also a world without authentic consensus either, which is bad. In fact, it's one where consensus is impossible. This all sounds pretty grim, but because I work at Wired, I, which is a uh, magazine about the digital revolution and how wonderful it is, I am professionally optimistic, even if I'm not always personally optimistic. So, <laughs> so let me put on my Wired hat and suggest some reason for hope. This situation exists for a reason, and it's not because people are naturally terrible, any more that they're naturally wonderful. It's because the structures of the news business and the internet business have incentivized this result. And I think it's pretty easy to see how you can change those structures to create something different. So uh, let's start by talking about what publishers can do. A few are already finding ways to opt out of this system. They're pursuing a radical new business model that could completely revolutionize the, new, the news industry. You wanna hear it? Yeah? Here we go. Ask their audience to pay them money. <laughs> I know, nuts. <laughs> and, and until recently, it was a bad idea because there were so many media outlets out there uh, publishing great stuff for free, why would you pay for it? But sadly, as more and more uh, quality journalistic outlets have gone away, as quality journalism has become a more precious uh, uh, commodity, we have actually found that people are more willing to pay for it. Now, probably not that many great publishers will be able to charge for what they do, but some will. And we've seen it already with the Washington Post, the New Yorker, the New York Times, other places like that. Um, the good news is that that favors a deeper, higher quality relationship than one built on drive-by clicks for pennies. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem of polarization. And those publications have actually all profited by appealing to their readers' hatred of Trump. But it is a model that makes it harder to survive by peddling outright lies. All right, the technology companies have also grudgingly begun to accept that they have a role to play here. Companies like Facebook have been very wary of moderating the content that appears on their sites. And frankly, for good reason. They're not equipped to be the arbiter of what's real and what's fake and what's acceptable discourse and what isn't, especially not at the scale that they're operating at. But that doesn't mean they're powerless. Right now, Facebook is optimized for engagement. Its whole business is built on getting you to click, share, and read. But imagine if it measured other values. Like, what if Facebook's algorithm made it more likely that you would see stories that other people had read to the bottom? What if it favored videos that were watched by people from both sides of the aisle? What if it favored stories that had the broadest geographic reach? That would immediately change the kind of news that gets produced. And finally, there's us, right? We are all publishers now. We need to take that responsibility seriously. Every time we open a piece of clickbait, 
To say nothing of liking or sharing it, we are making an editorial decision, and we are influencing what the rest of the world will read or watch. Now, we didn't ask for that responsibility, but we have it, and we can choose to continue to think like an audience, as a group that mindlessly receives stuff the internet thinks we will like, or we can think like editors, which as a one-time editor is fraught, but we can think like editors and ask the same questions that editors ask. Does this story pass the smell test? Is it thoroughly reported and convincing in its conclusions? Or is it just telling me what I, or what the reporter, or the publication want to believe? And maybe most importantly, I may not want this news, but do I need it? And I'll leave you with one last glimmer of hope. It's tempting to, extract, to extrapolate a future from any one moment in time, to say that because things are like this today, they will be even more like this tomorrow. But that's not actually how technology or the internet works. If you looked back two years ago, there is no way you would have predicted that we would be in this moment today. Behaviors change. Businesses change. Industries change, sometimes overnight. So I would urge us not to be defeatist. The future is not here. It's never here. It's always coming. And that means that we always have the opportunity to make it better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Our next speaker is Jonathan Albright. He's research director at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. Jonathan has conducted cutting edge research around networks of propaganda and misinformation, and his research into the use of platforms such as YouTube to proliferate high volumes of automated misinformation have been featured across a broad range of publications, including The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Fortune. Jonathan's understanding of how technologies are being deployed and networked through social platforms to create an ecosystem of targeted misinformation is central to understanding the current issues affecting both politics and journalism. Jonathan. Thank you. I'm just going to plug in here. My, my presentation is visual, so I'm going to take you for an exploration tonight. Hopefully. <laughs> there we go. OK. So just to, <laughs> well, not starting yet, are we? So just, just to kind of preface my, my talk, uh, one of the things that got me into this research area for, I guess, the fake news track of research is really uh, looking at systems and looking at sources. And, and one of the things that I was frustrated with uh, you know, around the time of the election was, was that there was a lot of blame, uh, and this kind of follows uh, Jason's, that there was a lot of blame put on platforms and there was a lot of uh, finger pointing for Facebook being responsible and for, for single entities that, that do have a lot of influence uh, for being responsible for the kind of aftermath of the, of the election or, the, or specifically for the election result and Hillary's loss. Uh, so I wanted to look at it from a structural, from a system level perspective in terms of uh, what, what are the, where are the sources of this fake news and, and, what, and where is it going and where is information flowing? So as I move through this, um, I'll, I'll kind of go through a few different themes that I just want to uh, touch on. The first one is what I started to see when I began this research was, was a new type of targeting and you know, I refer to it as data PR or data-driven public relations. And one of, one of the strategies with this is really uh, focusing on emotion, almost in a predatory manner, where where you're kind of you're targeting specific biases and, and predisposed uh, traits for individuals uh, with messages like this, uh, which is one of the uh, this was the top search result for when I searched for why Brexit won, and it was, says, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's an immigrant kind of very very controversial and loaded um, Facebook post from immigrants coming from a site called Truthfeed, and Truthfeed is I would say one of the one of the worst actors in in the misinformation ecosystem and, and highly polarized. So when you look at these types of uh, sources, you can kind of trace back. So a lot of this information is not coming from Facebook. It's not being posted on Facebook. It's actually being pulled out of uh, a network of thousands of sites that are spamming links all over the internet and are very, very uh, densely connected. So I call this micro-propaganda. 
And this, and this kind of micro-targeting isn't, isn't the old school kind of display ad. This is a very customized way of delivering messages that are specific to uh, target certain emotions and, and also to kind of propagate, to get people to organically share because this, this matters. Uh, so you, you probably can't see this too much, but one of the patterns that I saw in a lot of these sources, which I just showed you one that the post from Facebook came from uh, Truthfeed, is that there was a lot of social network. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, sharing coming from Facebook for traffic for these sites, but there was also a, a very, very high amount of organic search, so not paid search placement. And there was also a very, very high percentage of um, direct uh, URL links, which would, which would imply that, you know, text messaging or, or possibly email. So there were, there were kind of old school mechanisms that were used uh, that, that kind of aren't as glamorous as studying social media, but are still really important to, to how these kinds of operations or fake news ops are, are executed. Um, and search is, is one of the more concerning. So, but you can take this you know, beyond or, or pre previous to the kind of uh, to the US election, and, and you can almost, I, I would say this, the newer trend of this maybe started around the time of Brexit. Um, and one of the messages of uh, Brexit was immigration, and they, they, they hit this very, very hard. And uh, Jerry Gunster, is, is the, is a, he's a famous um, PR strategist in DC. Uh, the Brexit, he worked on the campaign for uh, leave for uh, England. So one of, the, one of his kind of main points is that the, the message is going to be based specifically on data, and we are going to take the data and dictate exactly what we're going to say and exactly when we say it. And this translated all the way through to kind of the types of nicknames that Trump used. I mean, so you're seeing a new pattern of, of attack. Um, so negative sentiment is, is also a theme in this, in this kind of industrial uh, data. And th there's a lot of um, purposeful uh, attacks that are based to kind of promote outrage. And uh, some of the presidential elections were, you know, com this, Trump is often rated the most negative candidate, and people were. This is this is why people were saying, "Well, how can he win? Everyone hates him." So, but he knew he had a very strong support base in certain areas, and you know he could essentially make that risk or make that calculated gamble to get people motivated enough to either spread his message or or vote for him. So I would say that you know, it's important to understand that, that there's kind of a data-driven uh, public relations strategy that's evolving. Um, that's a little bit different than before. I mean, they use some of the same techniques, but uh, specifically, it's focused on action. It's focused on not changing just opinions and, and, and attitudes about things, um, kind of in the traditional uh, strategic communication sense. But this is more about changing real, actionable behaviors, things they can measure. Um, the problem with this, obviously, is going to come down to this isn't a car. This isn't, this isn't, these, these things aren't a product that you want to buy or a service. Uh, this is democracy. I mean, these are democratic processes. So, um, I'm just to focus on behavior. Uh, just going back to to Jason, you know, it's emotion is the best way to make people react to something, and it's often not just action; it's often reaction. So again, when you start to look and see where these uh, sources are coming from, it's not just Facebook. It's not just it's not just these kind of hate speech websites. You know, this is this is kind of trickling all the way into sites like Google. Um, it's influencing people as they type and autocomplete search suggestions. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, complexity to this, and I don't want to frighten people, but um, a lot of messages are targeted in kind of a trial balloon sense, especially for Trump during the election to uh, see the response. So tw uh, Twitter is kind of a weapon in a way to get a response on something and use that data, um, and this is part of the, uh, his campaign strategy, is to use that data to essentially come back around and uh, retarget the message. So I wanted to see what the fake news ecosystem look like um, in this kind of in the context of this industrial data, and this is a scary map. I, but essentially, I, there were there were a list of fake news sites going around, and they were being shared of these kind of sites that were known to spread disinformation, uh, hoaxes, vi you know, viral propaganda, very hyper partisan content. So I took that list and I crawled every one of them for links, and some of them are very sketchy. So it was it was it was an interesting experience, but. You can use graph and network tools to kind of recreate the ecosystem or, or see what it looks like. And that was really important to me to show people what this looks like or, or get, give, them, give people a snapshot of how this looks. And if you, I, this is kind of hard to see, but um, you can see that YouTube is dead center in this. So m these, these kind of these fake misinformation sites are linking uh, not only into, uh, into Facebook and Twitter, but YouTube, and now it's kind of just coming around that YouTube is a big part of this. Um, YouTube is essentially kind of like a propaganda um, a, a custom propaganda cable channel in a way. And it's very, very important and very powerful because it also affects Google search um, and search placement. So, 
And the production quality of some of these videos that you would never expect to be kind of like highly produced, um, high definition, beautiful videos, I mean, that also tells you that there's motivations um, that exist beyond just kind of monetization or, or trying to, people trying to make money, but there's a lot of influence um, or intent to influence going on on this. So when you start to look through these things, uh, this gives you a sense of, of where to look next. So I wouldn't say that network, like the networks that I study uh, tell you exactly what is, but they, they tell you where to look, or, or they, they kind of suggest or hint what might be important to look at. So you know, when I was going through some of the most shared links in that uh, map that you saw before, uh, you, know, you see things like IP masking. So IP masking, app, you know, I thought about it for a while, and it, it suggests that you know, these are anonymous uh, Wikipedia contributions is, is a big part of this. So people are going and, and kind of using IP masking technologies, and not, not just VPNs, but actually hiding and, and making changes to like Wikipedia articles, which would be a very important strategic um, resource to, cha to change that, because it's, it's a community fact-checking tool, essentially. So just kind of going back to this, uh, structural things fo focus on sources. So where, where, where is this content coming from in the first place, and where is it going? And kind of the relationships between these actors. It doesn't necessarily implicate anyone outright as being guilty of fake news, but it more tells you the kind of structure or system that, that tends to support it, which we've definitely um, encouraged through various you know, technologies and through the way we monetize attention online. So this is, an, this is, a, this is another graph, um, and you can see just how polarized these sites, you know, this is, this is, this is a huge, um, this is thousands of sites with the left and kind of right wing ecosystem. And you can see that there's, there's very little connections in between these. And, and this is the kind of, this is what you end up with after years of, of kind of the internet and social media. And, you know, you're just getting very little overlap into uh, other people's op opinions or points of view. And, and linking doesn't tell you everything, but it does show a general um, kind of motif in, in how this uh, looks from a network perspective, which is very important for getting information across these party lines, especially, or ideological lines. So looking at these things, you know, again, you can see that, you know, some, most people have never heard of a lot of these sites that I started to see as, as major actors in, in the misinformation or, or very hyper-partisan news ecosystem. Uh, so rents.com is, is this massive hub uh, connecting to thousands of other, uh, I would say, very fringe websites. Uh, linking to things, conspiracy theories, and you can see that um, these are major players uh, in terms of promoting and supporting this misinformation ecosystem. Um, Conservapedia is another one, uh, which which suggests that they are building an alternative, a partisan alternative to Wikipedia. And these things are frightening. They're, they're not. I mean, these things are not trivial. And regardless of if it's successful uh, in building a right-wing Wikipedia, I think that's a problem. I think that we need. You know, there's there's no center anymore, and people cannot even. You know, they're building other other resources you know, and moving on when actually, you know, maybe we need to look back at the center a little bit. So uh, here's an example of how Wikipedia or how network kind of analysis can show you site where, where sites like Wikipedia might be targeted. And you can see that the, the proximity in this is actually important. Uh, it doesn't matter where the relative placement, but the proximity and how close they are together. So you can see that Russia Today is very kind of proximal to Wikipedia on the network and, and Reddit and WikiLeaks. So when you start to trace the links back, um, this suggests, it doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that you know, information from WikiLeaks is possibly kind of trickling through, being filtered by community forum sites like Reddit, and then kind of working its way into Wikipedia. So again, using this kind of data, you can go back and I can set, I can set trackers and I can see uh, changes on Wikipedia articles. And sure enough, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, not, not outright coordination, but there's a lot of coincidences in how uh, Wikipedia references are changing and being added. So I don't know if that's too, well, InfoWars is actually in there too. So the kind of clusters and interest clusters, uh, Donald Trump's Twitter is, is, a, is a very powerful tool in terms of influence. Um, it has about the same page rank, if you were to, if you were to estimate the page rank of, of Trump's Twitter, um, it has about the same authority as, as the New York Times. And, that, and, and this is kind of how you can see it's been very much set up as a tool. And, and this is not just limited to the right. I don't want to, I don't want to completely focus on the right. Um, but you can see how social media as an agenda setter can be a very powerful tool that it's not just about retweeting and sharing. Uh, when you get to this level of influence, Google will index you. So what he tweets about and who he links to is actually does have a, a slight impact on, on search rankings for those sites. And this is exactly why the kind of hashtags, the kinds of links are very strategic. A lot of this isn't random. 
So looking at these systems, uh, here's, here's a larger snapshot of a news ecosystem. Uh, what you can see is it's fragmented. It's, it's very, you know, very pushed off, and I would say that the more liberal or center-left sites have been pushed into a corner up at the, the top right. Uh, they're very cut off. And if you look at kind of the rest of the media ecosystem or the, or the political news ecosystem, uh, the, the red uh, are kind of everywhere. They populated kind of all over, uh, very much huddled around major resources that are free, like Wikipedia um, and YouTube. And so it's not, again, I'm just trying to reemphasize, it's not just Facebook, it's not just Twitter. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem of coordinated and also um, data-driven kind of influence that, that's happening. And a lot of it's coming from sites you've never heard about, thousands of them being created at once using WordPress, using automation. So, and also Trump's Twitter, just again, if you were to zoom in on this, I can share the link to my Medium post later. But if you were to zoom in on this, Trump's Twitter is basically cutting off the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's all the way over to the right. And it's essentially in between the, le the rest of the kind of left or center left media and the New York Times and Washington Post. So that's a very strategic position to be in terms of the network. So he's kind of in between um, splitting up the, the left-wing media, his adversaries. So again, network tells you a lot. It shows you themes. It shows you where to look. And um, you can see what's being targeted. And if you know what's being targeted, at least you have some idea of what to do as a countermeasure or, or at least what to look for. And I'm trying to make sure that I don't um, run out of time. So if you were to think about how things are linked on the surface in terms of URLs or, or hyperlinks or hashtags, there's a whole other side to the internet. And, there's, and this would, I would consider this, especially for politics and especially for data, um, it's tracking. So every time that we load a website, you know, anywhere from you know, 10 to 50 trackers load. Uh, some sites are notorious. They, they load you know, 100 trackers. And some sites are you know, less so. But the fact is, is that um, this kind of uh, infrastructure underneath the internet that you that most people don't normally see and is extremely pervasive uh, is, is helping to deliver very, very customized and specific content to you. So, and it, you know, this, this goes down to where you drive, uh, where you work. Um, you know, Facebook is linked into uh, databases like Nielsen for uh, shopping loyalty cards. So, and all of this data now is being, a, a big change is this, is, this is all being merged now. So medical records are being merged with shopping data, being merged with Amazon purchases. And I guess you can see where this is going, again, just to reemphasize, this is, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is, is voting processes, like is, is democracy. It, so this isn't just a normal thing that needs to be advertised or a service that needs to be sold. So here is, um, you can see this is the network of trackers that loaded uh, from my first round of fake news. I'll, I'll use that fake news, air quotes. Uh, and there's about, every time I visited one of these really terrible kind of very low grade sites that you wouldn't expect to see much, you know, about, I went four other places. Uh, so my, my identity essentially was kind of split in, and shared about four different places. Um, and again, it's not that bad, but you can see in the middle there, there's a big, there's an, a blue F. So this is not, you know, what you typically expect for the role Facebook played, but I, you know, I would argue that the role Facebook played as, as the highest impact kind of factor that Facebook contributed to what we see, what we're seeing now is not the fact that they're spreading content, but the fact that uh, campaigns, especially Trump, they can use these, uh, the infrastructure that Facebook has built for advertising to essentially target and customize messages. I mean, to, to the degree of thousands of A-B tests at once. They can send out 10,000 different versions of a message to see kind of what sticks and what doesn't, and then use that data to, and refine it continually. It's called optimization. So again, when I started to, oops, when I started to go to some of these sites, you know, you're seeing things, uh, secretsofthefed.com. Uh, a lot of them are .com. They're they're spawned kind of, you know, they're either done by machine algorithm or or they're done by kind of automation. But there's a lot of uh, issue based, and then they they add .com to it, you know, sign up the domain, throw a WordPress on it. But you know, Facebook is branded all over these sites, and and so is Twitter to a certain degree. But you can, it shows the kind of the intent, right? And I don't, I don't think that anyone who's a very hardcore conspiracy theorist who who you know thinks the Federal Reserve is out to get them uh, is going to go to secretsofthefed.com and like it on Facebook. It just seems, or maybe they are, I d but it just seems odd that these these very high level conspiracy sites um, would, you know, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense uh, except for tracking. So again, when you go to these sites, you, this, 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 this kind of confirms what you see from a network perspective. You can see the, the email, it's blocking people. It, it, kind of, it very much uh, pesters you to like something or email or to sign up for lists uh, or to get on a text messaging list. 
Um, here's a novel one. Uh, so when I went to one of the nastier uh, misinformation sites, I would say, I won't name names, but it says, would you like to see Hillary in, in prison? And it says, click like if you agree. Well, I mean, people are going to, I mean, absolutely. I, well, I mean, I'm going to, so, so once you like that, I mean, that's a very emotional driven, but it's also, so it's kind of a confluence of emotional and uh, confirmation. Well, you know, you want to see her, you agree with it. And so there's a lot of uh, things behind the surface that are going on. So when you look at the Facebook likes, they're heavily inflated on some of these sites. Sites that you've never, sites that get basically no traffic, you know, are sometimes having 100,000 Facebook likes, page likes. So there's a lot of automation going on that we need to be very, very aware of. And we need to understand that um, what we see, especially for messages and people and profiles, are not always and increasingly aren't going to be real people. Um, and that's, a very, that's really hard to do because often when we're uh, in politics, there's, there's kind of a sense that, if, you know, for support. Um, so these are things that are important to be aware of. So real-time location info. So phones are bleeding things in the background. This is one of the most strategic types of data that you can collect on people to understand where they work, where they live, what time they get up. And, and what they buy uh, when they walk into a Starbucks. So that's the kind of ad infrastructure. And I'm just going to kind of finish up with um, the last point I'll make, I had very little time, is to kind of understand that uh, the next, the future to some degree is wearables. Um, and this is kind of, this is where a lot of the campaigns are trying to get into. They want to, they want to gauge or estimate uh, people's response to campaign messages uh, through their heart rate or through their, their blood pressure. So, um, and this is a quote from someone who worked or was associated with Ted Cruz's campaign, which associates him with other things. Um, so, but he says, I think there's a big future in emotional response data. Um, and he says, the future of polling and marketing depends on the combination of emotional recognition data, points with combined with traditional survey answers. Um, and he says, why should I rely completely on what an audience says for regular polling when I can instead measure their reactions to a speech through an Apple Watch or through a, wear or through a Fitbit? So, I mean, is this, is this kind of a, a chicken and egg? I don't know. I mean, so, but in a way, we're being trained. And they're custom. So anyhow, I, don't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want this to be scary. I, I was trying to, like. <laughs> so that is my, that's my, uh, that's my takeaway is, again, I mean, I think that, that you know, critical, critical thinking skills are, are very important here and, and absolutely do not take anything at face value because media is customized right now and especially hyper fragmented to send you certain types of messages that you agree with, which is a, a slippery slope. And it's, it's causing the types of, I think it's causing a lot of the social issues that we're seeing now where people can't agree to disagree anymore. Um, instead, they, they, there's, a, there's a breakaway and the, the, the lack of a center is, is extremely concerning. So that is all of my amount of time. So thank you very much. Okay, now that Jonathan has freaked us all out, uh, thank you, Jonathan. We'll, we'll make it okay during the conversation, I promise, or I hope to promise. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Oreskes of NPR. He's, senior, he's NPR's Senior Vice President of News and Editorial Director. He's a recipient of three Pulitzer Prizes and three Emmy Awards. He leads an award-winning team of journalists and seasoned newsroom executives, several of them Furman grads, by the way. Uh, he has 40 years of professional experience in journalism, ranging from reporter to senior managing editor and expertise in shepherding the transition of traditional media to multi multimedia enterprises. He's co-author with Eric Lane of The Genius of America, How the Constitution Saved Our Country, and Why It Can Again. See, I told you it would be comforting. We welcome Mike this evening to talk to us about the value of a free and independent press in its essential role in democracy in today's climate of fake news. Uh, well, Danielle, thank you for that um, introduction. Talk about fake news. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, let me... Let me just try to humanize what our, my two colleagues have, done, have did before. Did before. They, they described to you these massive changes in uh, the way that media works uh, and the way information is distributed. Um, and they pointed out that, of course, that's destroyed the media's role as a gatekeeper. Well, what Danielle meant when she said that I'd been in the business for 40 years is that I was one of those gatekeepers. So in other words, 
I am one of the millions of Americans whose job has been destroyed by automation. <laughs> so I take this really seriously. No, I, I, thank you, and, and I want to thank Furman and the Riley Institute uh, for organizing this, because this is an extremely important conversation. And it's a particular honor to be here tonight with Secretary Riley uh, under the auspices of this institute that bears his name, because there really have been few leaders in the last generation of, of uh, political leaders who've been a stronger proponents of the importance of education and learning uh, in shaping our civic life. And much of what we need to talk about right now, and I mean right now tonight and right now in, in our country's history, revolve around that subject. And I have some things to say, but frankly, I'd feel very uncomfortable launching into them without first saying uh, to Secretary Riley, thank you for your leadership in all of this. Because You know, democracy is hard. It demands more of each of us than other forms of government. Ronald Reagan famously called it an informed patriotism. That's what he described as the country's need. Basically, democracy doesn't function without an engaged citizenry that's ready to debate and disagree and ultimately compromise around answers to the country's challenges. And from my selfish point of view, quality journalism doesn't survive without readers and listeners and users who demand to be presented with reality. Because without reality, they can't live up to their role as citizens or live their lives effectively. You can call this need civics or lifelong learning or continuing education. But it was central to the way the founders thought about this country. They understood that without informed, knowledgeable citizens, the democracy wasn't going to last. I was pleased to hear Professor Vincent mention um, my personal hero, James Madison, who put it this way. And I want to quote exactly what he wrote. Government without popular information or the means of acquiring it, which is, of course, what we're really talking about here, is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. Now James Madison was a man of many, many words. Brilliant words, but lots of them. It was for some reason when Madison and Hamilton and Jay wrote the Federalist Papers that had previously been mentioned, Madison just kept churning them out. And Jay like, wrote one, and Hamilton wrote a couple. And, but it was, the guy just was prolific, but brilliant. Anyway, Ben Franklin was pithier. A woman confronted him outside Constitution Hall in September of 1787. What kind of government have you given us, sir? He looked at her, and he answered, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. if you can keep it. The stakes were high then, and in fact, the founders didn't think it was going to work. Their, their writing and their conversations were full of the thought that it was all going to fall apart, that it was all going to collapse within a few years. They did not believe that the thing they had invented would work. That's, that's I think, a fairly established historical reality. Well, guess what? They were wrong. <laughs> it did actually work. We have never had perfect government. But to paraphrase Winston Churchill, We've had a better system of government than all the others. And that was pretty amazing. And the thing they really invented, the ultimate thing they invented, was a system of democratic government that could scale. That's what they didn't think was going to work. They actually didn't think they could create something, and they weren't thinking about a continent of 320 million people. They were thinking of a few colonies nestled on the East Coast. But they didn't even think it was going to work at that scale, but it did. But the thing about it is that the fundamental issue never changes. A republic, if you can keep it. And to keep it, you need to have a constituency, a public, a civic life that allows people to be informed. And that's the struggle we're in right now. 
So Furman has convened us here for the first of three weeks of conversation, important conversation, under the title, Media and Politics in a Post-Truth Era. So at the risk of offending my gracious hosts, I actually want to start by editing the title. <laughs> right? I mean, as an out-of-work gatekeeper, I can't, like, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> to be blunt, I do not believe we live in a post-truth era. In fact, I believe that idea is false, and let me talk about it for a few minutes to explain why. The best evidence I have to demonstrate that we don't live in a post-truth era is that we actually live in an era where powerful organizations and political movements and governments are prepared to kill journalists or jail them or bully them or threaten them to keep the truth from being known. Well, if it was a post-truth era, they wouldn't bother to do that. A few months ago, I gave a eulogy for two colleagues who died on a road in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. They were there on a journalistic trip to try to understand what was happening in America's longest war. They were killed in a Taliban ambush. Their names were being engraved on a glass wall memori memorial for journalists who'd been killed doing their jobs. The wall's maintained by the museum, uh, a terrific place in Washington, D.C., which I highly recommend if you have a chance to visit. But here's the chilling part about that memorial. The names of 14 journalists were added to the wall that day. My friends, my two colleagues, and 12 others. Of those 14, 12 were killed in their own countries, murdered for trying to bring the truth about their communities to their local audiences. It's a sad contradiction of our age, this supposed age of information, that suppressing the news has become a commonplace around the world, and a lot of the technologies that you heard our two speakers talk about have actually made it easier. Drug gangs and corrupt police murder journalists with impunity in Mexico. The so-called Islamic State permits only its version of reality, beheading or burning journalists who offer independent alternatives. And from China to Turkey, authoritarian regimes threaten and jail journalists to silence independent reporting. That's not a post-truth era. Free and independent information gives individuals enormous power, as Madison said so long ago, which is why strangling the free flow of information is such a high priority for authoritarian regimes and corrupt organizations. This suppression can take many forms. Just last week, Cambridge University Press, probably the most distinguished academic publishing house in the world, blocked access in China to more than 300 articles from their China Quarterly. These were articles on everything from human rights to Tibet. They were buckling to Chinese censors who had threatened to ban all of their other publications in China, the huge China market, and millions and millions of dollars were at stake. So they withheld information from Chinese readers. And of course, as, all, as long as I'm on the subject of the treatment of information and of journalists, we all know the administration in Washington has put much effort into undermining the legitimacy of independent news organizations. Is it all right if I take one second to say something personal on that front? Thank you. <laughs> you know, a question was raised the other day about whether journalists who cover the White House these days love their country. And I'd like to say something about that. Patriotism has many expressions. You can serve in many different ways. I believe it's an act of patriotism to believe in and be part of our constitutional system of informed democracy. This makes our country stronger. It's an act of patriotism to exercise the First Amendment rights to gather the news and publish or speak about the news. That makes our country stronger. We are of course, free, all of us, to criticize the work, to find it ill-informed or incomplete or lacking in some other way. That dialogue makes our country stronger. The First Amendment even protects the right of each and every one of us to challenge the patriotism of someone else whose ideas or work we don't like. 
But our country has learned some very hard lessons over the years about that kind of maligning and what it does to all of us. And I really think it was an unworthy thing for any of us to say that a group of Americans, of hardworking journalists, didn't love their country. I think it was especially unworthy for the leader of a country that so fiercely protects his right to say it. So I digress. <laughs> let, me, let me come back to my basic point. The idea of a post-truth era is actually a dangerous misconception of what's happening. It makes it seem as if we're victims of some cycle of history that's beyond our control. We are not. We face substantial technological challenges, and you heard some wonderful explanations of those. We face significant business challenges, and if you buy me a beer later, I'll tell you all about that. And we face some very unsettling political challenges that are feeling very new and different from previous challenges. But none of these challenges are beyond our capacity as a country to solve. If we do one thing, if we maintain our commitment to a basic concept or set of concepts that this country was founded on. And my simplest summary of this, and you heard a little bit this, of this before, there are facts. And facts can be established through rigorous process, whether a process of science or a process of law or journalism, which is a process that's designed to try to establish and confirm facts. Those facts can then be assembled to try to understand larger truths. That's a trickier process, not as obvious sometimes. This process of advancing our understanding of the world brought us out of the dark ages and into the space age. In fact, this process is so central to who we are as a people that it was baked in to the Constitution. You know, some of you probably know, although maybe you can't admit it to me, that on the wall of the Central Intelligence Agency, there's a quote carved into the marble from the Apostle John. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's an agency of the United States government saying that truth, fact, are the most important goal. And that is what they believe. But clearly, the challenge we're facing now is that there are people who have lost faith in that idea. Our challenge is not that we live in a post-truth era. The challenge. I think is better described by saying we live in a post-respect for the truth era. I'm sure many of you remember Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the very, very bright and interesting senator from New York, my senator, uh, who used to always say uh, when he got exasperated in a debate, you know, Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. <laughs> but increasingly, I think he would find this current world pretty aggravating. And I, I, I lay this out for a very specific reason. We need to crack the technology challenges that were described. And this is important work. Uh, the filter bubbles and the bots and the fake news mills and that kid in Macedonia. And that's real stuff, and we have to deal with it. We also need to f solve the financial challenges that were created by the way technology destroyed the business models that used to support most of the best journalism in this country. And I'm actually pleased to say that in public radio, we had a version of this uh, model long before everybody else did. In fact, our version of making you pay was to make stuff you liked so much that you would pay us even if we gave it to you for free. So that <laughs> So we have, we have technological problems, we have business problems, but at the end of the day, the strongest deterrent to fake news is a public, a citizenry, that demands real news. It, it, the deterrent of an audience that respects and wants to know the truth, good or bad, is the strongest way to prevent false 
and inflammatory and inaccurate information. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. And you heard some of the reasons why it's hard to do. But we have to believe that it can be done or we won't even try to do it. And everybody here, everybody in this room, everybody all over this country has a responsibility in this. And they have to accept it. You know, in the last years of his presidency, Dwight Eisenhower received a letter from one of the soldiers who served under him in, in the liberation of Europe. Now, actually, to some of you, I don't have to explain this because you remember, but the late 1950s were a trying time, a little contrary to some of what's been passed on. Uh, the post-war boom had really come to an end. Economic times were getting you know, a lot more like now than the early 50s. The fears of communism and nuclear annihilation hung over the world and divisions of race and generations, the kind of thing that would define the 60s, were already becoming increasingly apparent. A lot of people were very anxious and the soldier appealed to his old commander. He said, the country needs you to tell us what to do the way you did so successfully when we stormed Normandy. Well, it would have been simple for Ike to answer with some good wishes and a memory or two, uh, you know, thank you for your service. I think a lot of politicians would have written that letter, but he didn't. He did something very different and quite profound. He wrote back a letter, a long letter, quite a moving letter, in which he explained that political leadership was very different from military command. A general could and should tell his soldiers what to do. But in a democracy, it was for the people to tell their leaders what to do. Eisenhower didn't stop at that, though. He went on. And he explained the burden that this put on the citizen. Or as he wrote, these were Eisenhower's own words, dictatorial systems make one contribution to their people. And that contribution leads the people to tend to support such systems. And what was that contribution? Eisenhower wrote, freedom from the necessity of informing themselves and making up their own minds concerning these tremendous and complex and difficult questions. Now, Eisenhower wrote that long before the digital age. But I think you can see where I'm going. The truth is that an information system that makes it easy for you to just not do the work is very frighteningly alluring to people. And that's the real challenge. We can see now that the digital age, which began with such promises of improved and expanded democracy, has actually made the fundamental challenge of democracy, the fundamental work that each of us has to do to make democracy work, even deeper and greater and harder. The challenge that Franklin was worried about when he told that woman she was being given a republic if she could keep it. It hasn't changed one iota. It's just a lot more complicated. I don't think Franklin ever had one of those things with all those little dots. And <laughs> <laughs> Although he would have loved it, actually. You would have been in his almanac, and it would have been great. Anyway, <laughs> clearly our problems are made worse by technological change, because democracy, more than any other system of government, demands trust and faith. And we all understand that such trust is in short supply these days. We've been thinking about that a lot in, in news organizations and newsrooms and certainly in public radio. And before we turn to our discussion, I, I thought I'd just play you a short piece I did on the subject last November, the weekend after the election. And before I do, let, let me explain the context and why I think it's worth hearing this once again. So. The, the election last year and the aftermath of the election was an incredibly stressful time for journalists, obviously. And we'd been working very hard in the NPR newsroom, both all the way through the election and then in the week uh, after the election. So, you know, we were, we were exhausted and mentally burned out. Um, so what I'm about to play you um, is essentially the equivalent um, of the notes that James Comey made when he left the president's office. Media was I wrote these down so fast that they got to be true, because I didn't have time to make anything up. <laughs> anyway, this is, is a piece that my colleague Michelle Martin asked me to do, and you know I think it's still worth playing it one more time, so if I could. 
such a big part of the conversation during this election, we thought one person you might want to hear is NPR's news chief, Michael Oreskes. He spoke with us several times over the course of the year, along with other editors, to discuss how news executives were directing their coverage during this remarkable and challenging election. So we asked him to offer his thoughts on the role of media as we move forward. Journalism has been taking it on the chin. Lots of people just don't believe us anymore. They think we are tools of some amorphous establishment and they have turned for their news to other channels. Our president-elect hasn't been subtle in his views of the press. The fallout from this during the campaign was just not acceptable. Colleagues have been abused for their race, their creed, their origins, and their gender, or just for being journalists. This is more than just personally upsetting. A democracy cannot function without independent sources of reliable information. Politicians of all stripes would love a world without reporters a world where they decide what you learn about them. The framers had a purpose when they protected freedom of speech and of the press in the same breath as the right to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. An important Republican put it this way, as a conservative who believes in limited government, I know the only check on government power in real time is a free and independent press. Who said that? Mike Pence our vice president-elect. We'll be watching, of course, to see if he continues to uphold that freedom. But in the meantime, there are two important things we need to do to assure a free press. One of them rests with you, the listener, the recipient of our news. The other's on us, the journalists and news organizations. We need you, our audiences, to continue to believe in us and what we do, to favor journalism over a government press release or a fake news website. Since we are asking for your support, we owe you a clear statement of who we are and what we do. There are principles that make journalism something worth valuing. Here are three. Our first principle is that facts exist and that they matter. The central job of journalism is to establish the facts and share them as widely as we can. That builds a common base from which to debate the harder questions society faces over its values and its interests, and over who gets what share of the pie. It's shocking that I have to defend a faith in facts, but in our current world, many political leaders and their followers simply deny facts that don't fit their goals. That turns journalists from messengers into adversaries. Which brings us to our second principle of journalism. We must be independent. Our work shouldn't fit a pre-existing partisan or ideological or cultural view. If our reporting doesn't challenge your view of the world, we aren't working hard enough. Our only boss is you, and most good bosses want to hear the unvarnished facts even when they don't like them, which is why we were heartened by this note our colleague Sarah McCammon received the other day. While other outlets spend too much time wringing their hands and assuring us Trump could never get elected, you and your colleagues were out there talking to Americans who supported him. As a result, I wasn't that surprised he won and can understand some of the reasons. <laughs> oh, this writer couldn't resist adding, that doesn't mean I like or agree with them. Disagreement's okay. If we didn't have disagreements, we wouldn't need democracy to sort out our differences. Which brings us to our third principle of journalism and to what we as journalists need to do now. Civility is an essential value. If we can't speak to each other respectfully, democracy will disappear. Here at NPR, we believe strongly in the power of public radio to bring people together all over the country, to rebuild trust one community at a time, to listen and to hear each other out across lines of race and class, gender and religions, to talk to each other, not yell at each other. The country clearly needs that. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. And while they're moving back up to the stage for our conversation, will you please text your questions if you haven't already done so? For those who've written your questions on the card, pass them to the end of your row, 
and a member of the Riley Institute advance team will come by and pick those up and we'll get started. I get to ask the first question until they get me a set of questions, but I promise I'm going to ask your questions. Ah, there they are. All right. I want to start with, with just a general question. Any of the three of you feel free to jump in on this. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the how fake news works, the why the fake news works, um, and a little bit about what's at stake. I want to delve into that last part just a little bit further. What does the proliferation of fake news mean for democracy? Do people act on the disinformation? Is it just a matter of sharing it? Um, what, what are the concerns there? Well, I think the fundamental concern is that ultimately if different groups of people understand the world so radically differently at a base at the at the fact level if i think the world is just completely different from the world you think if i think the world is flat and you think the world is round we're going to we're going to insist on different solutions and there'll be no way to meet it's one thing to disagree about a value you know values we can find room it's a, certainly another thing to disagree about whether I get 22% or 25% of whatever we're arguing about. Those are all negotiable things. But if, if I see a world completely different from the one you say, we're never gonna be able to bring the, community, the different communities together. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of a philosophical crisis here as well. I, I, I'm reminded of, gosh, it must have been 2004, 2003, there was a piece in the New York Times with an anonymous advisor to uh, President Bush, who now everyone believes to be Karl Rove, uh, who famously said something along the lines of, you know, you guys think you go out and discover reality and then write about it, but that's not true. We are creating reality, and then you guys can try to catch up to us. Um, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and I do think that that broader approach to how the world works has gained purchase. Um, I just wonder sometimes, all these people who are, for instance, um, who believe the Pizzagate stuff, do they really, really believe it? Are, is that a statement of actual belief? Or is there a, anything's possible, you know, I live in the matrix anyway, and I may as well pick what I like, you know? Um, and... I don't know. I think, you know, of course, f from a civics perspective, I completely agree with what Mike says. Um, but there is also like an even more unsettling, like how grounded are we? How do we even communicate with each other if we can't um, believe that there is an objective reality to reflect? We give everybody the red pill or the blue pill. <laughs> One of them. So my take on this is is kind of a hybrid of, of what's been said already. Um, one of the one of the you know the key points to make in this is is news and, and, and media is how we make sense of the world. And often you know we often need that support. We need that system to understand uh, and and shape and kind of make sense of our realities. And and it's a very very important part of it that we it, that if it's lacking, I think that you know people lose they lose kind of touch with the base of of a foundation of of how to make sense. And I think that this is you know when you when you erode that. Uh, you, you're often ending up with the effects, you know, that we see where people are acting out in terms of hate, hate speech, but also, you know, getting on trains and stabbing people. Um, so I think that there's some there's some lingering effects that aren't necessarily the direct result of campaigns from from you know political campaigns or the direct result of kind of fake news that's being monetized. But I think that um, often things persist long after uh, they've won an election or long after the referendum's been won. And because it's cultural, so I think that you know you have to consider these uh, some of these things as um, what we describe as fake news is often effects rather than you know the the actual problem. So that's just my my cap on on the other comments. We've got several questions here wanting to deal with different aspects of okay. So what do we do given the climate? So I'm gonna we'll tackle a few of these. Um, one from Scott: uh, How can citizens combat the propagation of lies? Besides yelling, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> that is a good question. Anybody want to jump on this? 
I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. So I think that you know there needs to be a marketing campaign almost, or a, like a PR campaign to make skepticism like sexy, or or to make the truth even sexy, or to make it cool to be, you know, not swayed or convinced, or to make it maybe like an anti-emotional public relations campaign to get people to make it fashionable or cool. And I don't know, like you know, like a milk, almost like the old milk ads, or you know, milk it does a body good. I think truth does a body good. So. You know, I mean, maybe there needs to be an effort for that. I have a great way to do that. That video that they showed of me, that is one in a series that I've made for Wired called Argument Clinic. It is all about skepticism and rational thinking. So really what we should do is make that hugely successful and it'll solve all of our problems. That's so we Google Argument Clinic and your name or how do we get it? Right. Yeah, Works for me. I, this is a question we tackle in our classes a lot, right? Because we want to teach our students how to disagree with each other and how to talk to each other when they disagree. And so I think it is something we're thinking about. Uh, and so I approach it from the perspective of at the college student level, but I think we could be doing it in some ways more beyond, I think things like what Jason's talking about help because it reaches people not sitting in my college classroom. Uh, but even earlier in in homes and in elementary, I mean, not maybe elementary school, you don't want them yelling at each other, but you know, high school is a good place to start to learn these skills um, so that we aren't just yelling, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or more likely via social media at each other. But, you know, there's, uh, I'm sorry, you, get, uh, you were nice enough to mention my book, which is you know, a few years ago now, but uh, one of the things that I was really struck by when I worked on that book was I looked up the um, spending in the United States for civics education, which I'm sure Secretary Riley knows a good bit about, much more than I do. But one of the striking things about it was that basically beginning around 1960, basically beginning around Sputnik, the money spent on civics just went down and down and down and basically kept going down. Now, there were valid reasons because a lot of that money and a lot of that classroom time and a lot of that teacher time was replaced by STEM, science, technology. God knows we need that too. But I think we have we're, some of what we're seeing is a generation that was not given any real exposure. And that, that's actually what Reagan was talking about in his farewell address that I quoted from, was the, the way people are losing their connection to the basic ideas. And that does matter. I'm not sure we need to bring back civics quite in the old-fashioned way. But we do need ways to connect people to what it means to be a citizen. Another question, how is a society that depends on a well-informed citizenry, do we get back to a structure where there's objective news in which a majority of Americans can have faith amidst a fractured and partisan media landscape and where unverified information travels on social media? This is from Albert. So I'm sure I'm sure Michael can speak to this even more, but you know, one of one of the things is, you know, there's an argument that that news and especially news institutions don't shouldn't be always linked to business models and you know these most of the most of the news organizations right now are, are part of larger corporations uh, they have shareholders to report to they have stock prices they need to you know they need to grow um, and that's a big problem I think that you know to be independent uh, you can't be you can't be um, held hostage by by shareholders or, or, or your stock price um, it's it's a different type of product and again you know distinguishing information and news from from other types of consumer products is, is very important. So, you know, maybe there needs to be new monetization systems or new business models for this too that aren't relied on on profit. I'd like to sort of build on what you're saying. Um, because so much of the news media is, is advertising based, it favors a, I guess we're talking national news here. Um, it favors a certain news targeted or written with a certain reader in mind. And usually that reader is of a certain socioeconomic background, um, you know, if your publisher can sell this, my target, re my my average reader is a white male, 55 years old with two houses. That's a more attractive reader, you know, than others. So there's an overwhelming amount of the news is written or produced with that person in mind. Um, you know, when you look at the huge swaths of the country that feel like the news isn't written for them or isn't in their voice, they are right. I think they are correct. And I think that some of this alienation that people feel is justified. Um, so it's very, very hard um, to find a way to, you know, I think about, in a weird way, I think about Grail Marcus uh, was a music writer, and he wrote about pop music, that the great 
dream of the pop musician was to, uh, I'm going to mangle this, but it was something about to create something that could unite a divided country. Like when Beyonce records a great song, it that's why mus pop musicians are there, to reach as many people as possible and bring them all along together. And I do... I don't know that there's a business model that supports that approach for journalism, but it is kind of, I, I, I am inspired by that idea. So I have a very specific thought, and it happens to be, by coincidence, the thought that we're working very hard on in public radio, because I think it's part of the answer. I don't think it's the whole answer, but it's part of the answer, and that's local news. The, the, I mean, you only have to go by the Greenville Papers former site to see all that rubble to understand that something pretty serious has happened to local newspapers all over this country. And, and, it, and, and, and the reality, to echo what you guys are saying, but almost in reverse, is the best place to build trust and credibility and connection with people is at a local level. So we think, I personally think, just from my experience, and we think in public radio, that the most important thing that needs to happen now is a rebuilding of local journalism around the country. We happen to think that we can be part of that and play an important role, as South Carolina Public Radio is trying to do here, but, but this really isn't a commercial message. What it's really saying is that groups of people, both probably for-profit and not-for-profit organizations working together, I think can do a lot to restore uh, quality journalism, reliable journalism, and most important of all, connected journalism to people by doing it locally and then we'll, we'll, we'll get back up to the top eventually. But it's, you know, I just don't think it's possible actually to fix everything that needs fixing right now at, at the level of 320 million people. I, I just don't think we can do it. But I do believe that we can go community by community and make it better place by place. And I actually think that's starting to happen. And it's starting to happen both in the work we're doing in the not-for-profit world. And there are now a number of commercial ventures that have seen the giant vacuum in local news and are beginning to try to find solutions. And, you know, frankly, as a citizen, I wish them just as much luck as I wish myself. So, you know, I hope we all work. I hope we all win. And just to kind of jump into why that may be very important, um, I think increasingly just in the last few months I've heard more and more people talking about turning their attention to influencing their local governments. Our local governments are much more accessible to us anyway. Right. And I think one of the reasons we've neglected trying to influence them for so long is because we don't get as much information as local media have declined yep. to, and to contract. And so I think that that could be a way to, to begin to deal with, with some of the concerns about how do you get good information started at the local level. Um, Interesting question here. Are legitimate independent news organizations encouraging or forcing some readers to rely on fake news by charging for their real news? Yeah. I mean, no, I think... I think um, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad this question came up because I, I talked about these subscription models and how great they are, but I do think they, as with um, you know, television, for instance, I think that you do potentially end up with a very bifurcated system where you know a, a certain group of people who uh, either can afford to or decide to value real great news will pay for it and most people will not and there will be a real difference in terms of the their understandings of the world and I think that is not great I mean we obviously um, have tried to create a model where we're happy to accept your money in fact, I'll be up here afterwards if you. Um, but we don't make you pay. So essentially, we view it as our mission to reach every citizen we can reach, but we also depend on you to support us. And, and, and that's a that's a that's a model we can adopt because we have other sources of support. I mean, many state governments support their local public radio and television. Uh, the federal government obviously gives actually quite a small amount, but but does give some. Actually, it is really small. You should hear, I won't, I won't tie you up tonight, but you should hear about my visit to Toronto where I was on stage with the head of the British Broadcasting Corporation and the head of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I told them what portion of my budget is actually federal money, and they looked at me like, how, you poor thing. <laughs> <It's> just, but, <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's a story for a different session. <laughs> All right.
right, Jonathan, this next one we knew was coming. It's for you. Others can chime in. Uh, Jonathan's comments are frightening and suggest that votes can be bought. What hope might he provide or suggestions for coming back off the ledge? This is a great question. So nothing changes. We can get angry. We can, we can get passionate about things. We can, you know, we can polarize ourselves even more. But I think that fundamentally that the, the fake news, quote unquote, problem needs to be dealt with at a regulatory level. There, needs to, there, there are no rules. There are very, very few rules. So for example, in politics, you know, there's no, you cannot trace back uh, what's been placed on Facebook or Google or there's no record. This, this, these things disappear into vapor. So with tradi more traditional media, you can cut out, you can clip out the newspaper ads or you can look at the mailers or you can look at, you can look at the video segments or the, the 30 second ads. Um, but when, when these uh, campaigns are placing things and especially through things like super PACs, uh, they're placing, you know, 10,000, 20,000, $30,000 Facebook media buys. Uh, and these are just the ones we know about because they're often contracted out. There's nothing. It's vapor. So there's no rules for, for online or digital politics. There's no accountability. And that f is a fundamental issue that needs to be dealt with on, at a regulatory level. Some things you can't solve through other types of processes. This needs to go through the legal. And I think that hopefully, my hope is that a newer generation of, of lawmakers is going to maybe come in soon. Um, and... <laughs> When I mean new generation, I mean people that are kind of digital, like I'll use the, the horrible term digital native, but people that are kind of have gr grown up with a different understanding of, of digital media. And hopefully we can like change some of this, but I think that nothing, if you don't, if there's no rules, then that's, that's the fundamental issue. There have to be regulations and policies that stop this. All right, alongside users need to be their own editors, does social media have a moral responsibility to change their algorithms to ensure a variety of news, news that challenges the opinions of all users um, and ensure that this kind of news is seen in user, users' news feeds? Moral responsibility? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, in fact, I think, I think we're mostly talking about Mark Zuckerberg here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think he has begun to acknowledge that. I mean, I think the really tricky thing is, so his initial response after the election when people were starting to accuse Facebook of um, leading um, to the sort of weird moment uh, was to say, no, you know, actually, if you look at the data, people see a diverse, a much more diverse collection of voices on their newsfeed than they do from reading the mainstream media which may be true, um, but the, the, the thing that I'm not sure he gets is that he equates, or at least at that time, he equated something that my crazy uncle said with something that was written in the Weekly Standard or something, right? Like, they're not the same thing. Um, and just because my crazy uncle says something, it doesn't mean I pay attention to it. It doesn't mean I believe it. So I think it's a little bit trickier even than... I mean, I think that is necessary but not sufficient, right? Exposing people to different viewpoints. Um, but broadly, yeah, I think they, I think they, because of the way, they are a private company, right? Their first and really only uh, uh, re uh, responsibility is to their shareholders. That's the problem, right? Um, we can talk about their moral responsibility all they want, but they are actually legally obligated to value their shareholders over everybody else. So until there is a profitable way of doing that, until we can point to some sort of financial risk but for not doing that, um, it's a pretty tough argument to make, I'm afraid. I think we're actually at a fascinating moment. And these two guys have, have said a lot of very smart things tonight. And I hope uh, everybody appreciates how much, how great it was to get to listen to them. Because, you know, the idea that we're in any kind of a permanent situation is debunked by everything that's already happened. And one of the things that you see happening repeatedly is something is offered up as an almost religious fact, a, a digital act of faith. And then eight weeks later, it's gone. Well, or maybe a couple of years later. And, you know, I've lived through a whole bunch of these now, right? I mean, the, 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 and I, so I actually don't, know that a lot of the things that Zuckerberg and the Google guys and even Microsoft in its way, a lot of the things they believed, they might have actually believed them. I'm not sure it was, I don't, but, but they were naive in an extraordinary way, or well, anyway, they were wrong. And 
And so the idea that these organizations would do nothing but good and would just be a source of, of a, you know, freeing us all to live in a different, better world has just proven not to be true. And now we have these huge companies, and this, I mean, really, the scale of these companies is, is boggling. Amazon, Google, Facebook, of course. And the country's really been a long time since we had to deal with that kind of situation. It maybe is a little analogous to the railroads. I mean, these, these groups of um, corporate citizens who had a power over the rest of us that um, if exercised without any kind of um, outside influence could do you know, great harm and they, and they didn't even necessarily realize what they were doing. And I think we've now, the, the good news, which I, I'll say what you said, but a slightly different way, is I think we've now entered a moment where they themselves have been forced to face that. Where that's gonna go is a really fascinating question right now. But, I mean, they can't, pre they can't really pretend any longer that the effect of what they did in building their businesses destroyed a d another business. Now, you know, that's, that's Schumpeter. I mean, that's, that's creative destruction. But that business had a, had a civic role. And it was an important civic role. And, you know, <laughs> for those of us in this room who know publishers of newspapers over the years, we know they weren't saints either. But, you know, they took very seriously their connection to the community, their obligation to the citizenry, their role in protecting freedom of information. And so the people who replace them don't even, those issues are not even on their radar. So that's part of what we're dealing with now, which is they destroyed one industry and have not had any interest in even acknowledging the destruction or the role that now needs to be replaced somewhere as if the society is going to continue to have some of those benefits. I, I'm sorry to keep yakking here, but I want to make a quick um, addendum to my earlier remarks, which was about how hopeless this all was and how until it's, you know, until there's a shareholder uh, argument, it's nothing's going to change. That's actually not true. Um, the reason why Mark Zuckerberg has started to take this stuff seriously and they've hired a news division and all this stuff, I actually, first of all, I think personally he's probably well-meaning um, at heart to the degree that matters. But I think what really has happened is that the people who work for Facebook got really, really freaked out. And the engineers in Silicon Valley have got an inordinate amount of power. And if they feel they have been, they work at these places because they believed it. They think they're making the world a better place. And if they wake up and say, wait a minute, maybe I made the world a worse place, they're gonna not work for that company anymore. Um, and that's why Travis Kalanick had to stand up and step down from the President's Advisory Council. All these things that there's no business reason to do, it's because the employees actually do have a lot of power. And I think a lot of the pressure to deal with some of this stuff is actually coming from them. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question here. Uh, and this, is, this may be a good one to end on. When we come across a news article, what's the best way to evaluate the source and determine if it's fake news? That's from Allie. Well, I'll, I'll comment. This, that's a very, that's a impossible question to answer, I think, because it would, it completely depends on the context, the story, the content, the time of, you know. So I think that the, the, the thing that you shouldn't do is share it. Um, I think that even if, even if uh, platforms like Facebook didn't censor the news, I think that they could, they could very much help by maybe just even putting a time delay. And I don't know if that's a form of censorship, but because when you look at the sharing tools on these platforms, they're all emotionally loaded, all of them. So Facebook has literally, their, their, their kind of palette of sharing is called reactions. So that, that tells you something. We're being trained to a certain degree uh, by platforms to act in certain ways. And if that's not obvious by Facebook's reaction, which are basically a bunch of different emojis and arguably the most uh, shareworthy uh, emotional expressions, so awe, anger, um, I think that you know, we, they need, we need to look at these types of uh, things. So I'd say the best, way, the best way you can stop it from spreading and the best way you can slow it down is give people time to think about it. And we need to stop, we need to pause and think about things but, and, and not immediately share. That would, that would very much help. That's not the answer directly to the question, but I think that's a major component of, of why these things tend to spread like wildfire and become like social level or cultural level problems. Um, you know, there's a group uh, called the News Literacy Project. I don't know how many of you Heard of it, and you know you can find them easily on on the internet. 
and they do a lot of really good work. And, and it, a lot of what they've done is actually designed for high school students, so it's really easy for the rest of us to understand, <laughs> and, like me. Uh, but, but it actually goes through a lot of really interesting, good, just step-by-step -step ways in which you can ask yourself questions about a story and, and get to whether, you know, was it done in a journalistic way that might have actually tried to figure out facts. And you can't always get to the root of it, but a you can do a lot more than most people are used to doing because we're so used to the way news used to be brought to us, which was, I kind of trust the package. And you mentioned this earlier, you know, I mean, when... When all your news came wrapped up in a package called a newspaper or a television show or a radio show, um, you're, you basically were turning over the consumer protection part of your role to the, to the distributor. Well, a lot of that's gone and a lot of that's broken down, so more of it is on you now. And I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to talk about, which is each of us now as an individual, whether you want to view that as your, your citizen's right or just your consumer duty, have to do more to figure out what's real and what's not, but there are ways to do it. That's all I'm saying. And there are other groups. I don't mean to single out news literacy, but they're, they're one of the better groups at just giving you easy tools to help figure out how good your news is. Yeah, I would also just say, like, if somebody, if, you, if you're sharing some news that you heard, that somebody says, where did you hear that? You say, oh, I read it on Facebook. Right. You have failed because <laughs> Facebook is not a publisher. Facebook is a distributor. Know the source of the information and if, you, if it is unfamiliar to you and you don't know that they are a trustworthy source, read something else that they have written. And if it sounds exactly the same, and it also sounds maybe too good or too bad to be true, like just proceed with caution, you know? I mean, it, it really does come down to people. I mean, we've spent a lot of time uh, critiquing uh, uh, the media and, and critiquing technology, um, but I'm reminded of a line that Barney Frank once had. Um, he said, you know, everybody's always complaining about the politicians and how terrible the politicians are. Let me tell you something. The voters are no great bargain either. I just have, I have one more thing to add on top of this. Um, and I think that, you know, there's been a huge shift in content and the type of content. And I think from in the past maybe 20 years, we've seen this a dramatic shift in the percentage or maybe even ratio of, well, advertorial would be one of them. They call it advertorial. Um, but also, most news or, or a big portion of news right now is not kind of your typical reporting, your, your inverted, inverted pyramid. Um, this is, like most news that we're, a lot of news that we're exposed to are kind of more editorial columns. They're, they're opinion columns. And I think that's a huge step. Like, it's even tagging those as, as kind of objective versus opinion or, or opinionated. Um, would be a huge step, uh, simple, but a huge step in maybe getting people to kind of think about things before before they share. Because most news, honestly, the most most news that I read and during a day is probably 90% is I would say opinion based and not fact based. I call I call it perverted pyramid instead of the inverted pyramid. The worst duty of the moderator is to have to bring things to a close. Um, I thank you folks for coming tonight and for your very good questions. I want to say a special thank you to Ollie and the Riley Institute for putting this together and sponsoring it. I want to say a very, very special thank you to Jill Fuson of the Riley Institute who has worked tirelessly to coordinate these schedules and get this thing put together. And finally, thank you gentlemen for your participation. We appreciate it. Folks. Next week, we'll be in McAllister Auditorium at 5.30 for part two of this discussion. Uh, if you haven't purchased your tickets, uh, then get that done online quickly. Uh, students, you don't need to register. Just show up early. Thanks. Have a good evening.